The motion is on the screen, and so are the teams, and there is big signs. So that any further ado, I'm the Prime Minister to speak to the motion. <laughs> The education system fails people who aren't white, fails people who aren't wealthy, strips communities of their autonomy, strips communities of their freedom and their culture, and allocates those decisions to Richard. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that is fucked up, and we're going to explain how that hurts people and how we make it better. What am I going to talk to you about? I'm going to walk through the model, explain how this is going to work. I'm going to explain just how bad the like government controlled education system is, and how we make it comparatively better, and how that brings benefit to communities, particularly vulnerable minority communities. All right, okay, so let's just quickly talk about uh, our model. First, like, where we think local communities, to a limited extent, involve, like, maybe local governments oversight, but they look like iwi, they look like people who live in those communities, they look like advertising to those local communities that now as being a member of your school board is being elected to that you have a lot of power and you have a lot more ability to engage and shape your schools so think that like local communities will be those boards people elected by local people and they will make decisions we think budgets to an extent like uh, they will come up with a budget and there will be oversight from local government to make sure that's okay and those funds will be allocated to them like, we think this is all fine and not an issue in the debate local schools will be controlled by boards from their local communities okay so Let's talk then about what's wrong with the education system. And the first thing to say is it's controlled by the government, and the government is a bad actor. Why is government a bad actor? Because government, particularly civil service and the people who deal with education, are just like white, rich dudes, right, who have got into being a bureaucrat and have now been assigned or shuffled around to being in the education department where they've signed the policy for schools. And it's really weird because the policy is really messed up and fucked up and changes all the time. Like you have school cert, then you have NCA, then you have standardised testing, then you have allocational testing, then you push kids who are dumb into certain testing areas because you believe that is what's better. And you ignore the communities and it changes constantly. Second, it's just bureaucratic and it's controlled by politics. Parties campaign on political platforms of what they want to like teach in schools. So if the government says we believe that everyone should learn Māori history, a whole bunch of white people in Ringuera like uh, lobby their politicians to not allow this to happen. And then schools that actually want to teach this right can't do that because the government, like that's affected by the political nature of who wins uh, election and who decides on what schools should teach. Right? So that's particularly bad. Schools also just systematically fail people who are not different to the, the majority of what is decided to be taught. It looks like the allocation of what books should be taught in schools, what should be tested on, how much testing there should be, decisions made by people of what the general threat of disciplinary sorting should be. It looks like schools aren't prepared yeah. to deal with people who come into high school illiterate, who come into high school with serious backwards and gaps in their knowledge. So. Schools fail that because they are designed by a majority that is wealthy, that is white, and that is dominant, right? And that's particularly bad for poor communities, it's yeah. particularly dangerous for minority communities. I'll take close. So uh, local elections, whether they be for local government or school boards, tend to be even more dominated by wealthy white people than national politics due to local amounts and much higher influence of money. Yeah. Why then do you get better? Okay, she had like, listen here, right? The, the, the communities we're most worried about are communities that are primarily dominated by poor people or by a particular minority group. Now the reason they don't all run for school boards is they've got no fucking power right now, right? Because the government decides the majority of how their school should work. If people so, know that they can make a legitimate change in the communities, they will. And also, it's just fundamentally not true that it's majority like nefarious people in charge of school boards in poor areas, right? Often, principals and board leaders want to make a positive change in their communities, but they know they can't because because their schools are failing school, there's enormous government oversight put into that school and how it's run. So it's really tricky to do anything well. If you give people power, they will take it. Poor people and minorities don't just sit back and let white people lead them, right? Okay, let's then talk about how we make that change and encourage and incentivize communities. When people know that they have power over how they can just insert their schools, 
We think that people from the local community will run and they will run with support. Why? Because when they're in power and as board members and leaders of local schools, and also we're having a model and things that a lot of schools do now, like having an official EV representative from the local EV, right, to help decide on board issues. When you get local money control and local control boards, it means you can do things like change how the disciplinary system works in that school. So you can run it using tons of other systems. You can, you can have a school that is focused entirely on making sure there's lots of use of nail in the classroom. You can uh, make sure that all the books in a school in a suburb in a, in a like a, a lower sub, a Detroit right of books by African American authors instead of the statewide education board deciding which old white man we should read about today right it looks like you can change uh, how the school functions what the school is how much inside and outside time there is for kids whether there needs to be more remedial classes in place because people in your district are generally going to school with gaps in their education and knowledge that need to be particularly filled in, right? That's especially important for communities where they wouldn't traditionally get this assistance, where they wouldn't traditionally get this help, right? And it also helps depoliticize the nature of education because one of the big harms I flagged to you when I was talking about structure was that a lot of what we teach in schools is political because Parties run on platforms because most school stuff is decided at the government level. When it's local communities and local boards making that decision, that takes a lot of that out of the hands of the government. So it means that if a school in a particular area wants to do something, it's no longer a national decision or debate on whether we should teach a particular thing. It's just something that the local community does and has control over. And that's really, really important. And I'll take you, John. Yes. Would you source it minimum standards centrally? Okay, let's talk about testing standards. I just think it's just like utter crap that you need entire like nationwide national standards in order to determine the intelligence of a person. Because A, that relies on that intelligence being decided by a white guy in Wellington, right? And B, to get into university and be successful in life, here's what you need to do. You need to be able to write an interesting and coherent essay on a subject that's important to you. You need to be able to understand certain mathematical like equations and be able to be really good at a certain subject. You don't need an entire national standard officiated and tested or a minimum standard to prove that. Like education systems in, the, in, in Scandinavia have almost got rid of all standardized testing and their education systems are considered very, very important in advance. We're happy for schools and local communities to decide what counts as intelligent from their students. And we think universities have the maturity and intelligence to be able to equate that into accepting people into the university. So what did I say? I said, we depoliticize this, meaning the local community is more autonomy. Look, at the end of the day, if there's some holdout white suburb that still teaches it's like Auckland grammar bullshit, we're fine with that. If minority communities able to have power and control, decide how those schools work and what counts as intelligence. Don't give poor kids failing grades just because you come from Wellington. Great, and now welcome the leader of the opposition. Don't not go on school boards because they don't feel they have enough power. The school boards over in Remuera and Epsom have enormous amounts of fucking power. Poor parents don't go on school boards, don't have any fucking time, don't have any fucking money, don't have any fucking political connections to be able to leverage that situation, right? So here's the dumb fucking part of their case, right? What they say is, oh, let's give school boards enormous amounts of autonomy, enormous amounts of power. And that means to like the poor brown people will rise up and shake their school. In reality, they don't have any time to shake their school. They don't have enough political leverage to take advantage of the local government oversight mechanisms that they want to institute to take advantage of your autonomy. Here's what happens. All 
all the all the wealthy people they want to describe in the case they start stropping up treated white tongue in their local community. They start stropping out all the kinds of conversations about civil rights in the southern part of the United States. What about the poor brown schools? It was just status quo for them, right? Because they don't have the time, they don't have the energy, because they work long hours, they don't have the money to take advantage of local political connections, go through the complicated local government oversight mechanism they want to introduce in the debate. So here's the end of the world for them. Poor brown schools they're worried about keep status quo. Rich, wealthy schools, now they just make their like curriculum more racist. What a huge fucking backfire for opening government. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm going to talk about the value of a curriculum and why we support minimum standards yeah. because we think that's targeted the real problem in New Zealand education. And then I, then I suppose I'll, I'll respond a little bit more to the case. Right, what's the value of a curricula? What they missed, right, is that teachers might be like good at teaching kids on the day to day, but what they are not are pedagogical experts across the entirety of the experience of children everywhere, right? So we don't want to eliminate the connection to a curriculum for uh, for like local schools and that kind of thing and eliminate minimum standards for how you teach children. They won't know, for example, the hundreds of hours that Richard Darth might have gone into a Wellington's research, how you e how you educate dyslexic kids in an appropriate way, the literature you can draw on, and the expectations how to educate them probably, right? The hundreds of hours that goes into work as to how to appropriately blend the use of Tereo and say history classes to ensure that children from diverse cultural backgrounds get value out of that, right? Like they miss the fact that a centralised education isn't just guards sitting in office being like fuck brown people, right? <laughs> it's an enormous amount of policy work to discuss and work on like how you can blend together the expectations for children across the country with diverse expectations. I want to make a note here and defend the New Zealand curricula for, for the at least one like Ministry of Education policy professional high know in the room. <laughs> like, like, yes, there are minimum standards that exist across the whole curricula uh, and exist around the whole country, but there is a degree of flexibility in how we allow children to learn about like different like parts of the curricula, for example, right? So if you're in like Dunedin and went to school there, like Bridgeo and I did, right? Like you might learn about the experience of like colonialism in New Zealand through the experience of like Kaitahu down there and the connections they had with like New Zealanders, with, oh, sorry, uh, like new New Zealanders and all that kind of stuff. The point is, is that you can learn about different experiences and different culture through the lens of your personal experience, your local community and that's good. But crucially, we teach in a way that upholds minimum standards. Okay, I want to make a note here about what we think is probably the most pressing problem in the education system today, like, which is literacy and numeracy. Like, children are going to the workplace, or leaving schools and going to the workplace, not being able to read, not being able to write, and their lives then become misery. And we actually underweight that, right? Because if you can't read, and if you can't write, you will never get a good job. Because you, it's not that you, like, can't go off the university and that kind of thing. You can't work as like an office administrator. Like you probably can't be an assistant manager sure. at your local supermarket because you can't calculate the margins on the fruit and veg section. But like, your life will be held forever. Sure. And, and, and what they say is that minimum standards don't matter. May as well throw them all out the window because the more pressing problem in this debate is like cultural connection and critical analysis and all that bullshit, right? Which is like nice, I guess, if you've met certain minimum expectations, but I care more about the fact your life won't be on minimum wage forever than you being able to critically analyse perhaps a colonial history. I know the woke group won't like that, but I'm sorry, it matters more opening. Do you mind telling us how your white control central standards have helped Maori and Pacifica, who are statistically the ones that are lack numeracy and literacy? It is, it is bullshit that we just have this white centralised like, authority around education. I'm sorry, I'm just going to call it out for this. It is bullshit. Like, like, we learned about colonialism from a very young age in the New Zealand curriculum because policy professionals in Wellington, for a couple of reasons, put that in the curriculum and teach children about it. The first reason is because there will be a national outcry if it wasn't in the education system. It's been instituted in the New Zealand education system since the 1970s because Maori got in the streets and marched from Northland to Wellington at Hay Point, tens of thousands strong, to demand that their experiences, their language, their culture were included in the New Zealand curriculum. The Hay Point would be 10 times larger if we removed it from the curriculum today. The second reason is, and I'm, I'm sorry, but 
Richard Dart is not this white nationalist that you want to frame. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 let's, let's be quite serious here. Richard Dart is a quite modern cosmopolitan individual who understands the diverse experiences of people from all around the country. Like, I'm sorry, but just because you might not think that he's as woke as you'd ideally like him to be, he is at least in the one percent woke individuals in the entire country, right? The problem, and, and in reality, he is emblematic of a quite diverse, urbane, cosmopolitan public servant class that lives in Wellington and designs the curriculum, right? That is a good thing. Like, that is a good thing that they're able to, able to override the expectations of, say, racist, like, uh, awful communities and, I don't know, Invercargill or places like that, right? And it's good that they're able to impose certain expectations there, right? Um, is that two claps? One clap. Oh, bloody good. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, so, but what happens in certain communities where they feel like they do know better? And this is the real, like, risk of their case, right? Because if quite charismatic, angry people like Kia are able to whip up rage in local communities about how, like, no, quite seriously, the emotion of Kia's case is the sheer risk of his case, right? Because if they're able to emotionalise certain communities to say, let's throw this learning about maths and English and stuff out of class, we need to talk about how these kids are being oppressed, and we need to talk about their cultural, critical experience. The maths goes out the window, the language class is hard, and that directly undermines the minimum standards which we think are so important in open opposition. Children are leaving schools, innumerate, and illiterate. It is not because Richard Darth is racist. It is because we do not uphold minimum standards in that education system, allowing emotional charlatans like Kia to whip up rage in local <laughs> communities and destroy those curricula. It would be awful for those children. Great. We welcome the Deputy Prime Minister. Do you just say that in a country where Māori and Pacifica children enter university at rates substantially less than children who are white, where Māori and Pacifica children are the ones who do not meet the literacy and numeracy standards you are so concerned about, to say that our education is okay, to say that our education is one that empowers communities, to say that our education system is not one which fails to channel Māori and Pacifica children into jobs and into higher education, to say that that system works, we think this is entirely unacceptable. A few things to talk about in this speech. Firstly, literacy and numeracy and why the current system has failed and who it is failing. Secondly, I want to talk to you briefly about teacher, uh, why government is a terrible actor, why I purely haven't engaged in. And lastly, I want to talk to you about teachers. Okay, why is literacy and numeracy a problem? Because the government has created a system which is a broad brush approach designed to suit the standardised child. The child who every year meets the standards that have been set out for them, is able to pass sufficient NCA credits, is able to read that the level who is fixed, and it's very hard to cater to children who don't meet those standards at every level. The problem is that children who are poor and children who come from disadvantaged backgrounds enter school already behind their white and rich peers. They haven't had parents who have been able to sit down with them and teach them the alphabet and teach them how to read because they because there's parents who are too busy, those parents are too poor, those parents are illiterate and undereducated themselves. In a situation when you are not supported by your family, you enter the system already failing the standards. Teachers are taught to teach to the standard that they have in the classroom and in big classes and being underpaid and not having enough time, they cannot devote to raising up the one child who is already behind at the beginning. And so every year, that child slips further and further behind in terms 
of literacy and numeracy. They don't have a parent at home to help them with their homework. They don't have a system that is set up to allow the teacher to teach to them and to cater to their abilities. That overworked teacher is unable to help them. And so we slip into the loophole. Those children are given achievement standards to do, which they are able to pass, because that gives the school statistics that look good for central government, a sufficient passing rate, but do not give children um, the skills that they need to write a coherent essay and be able to engage in the university system. They meet the literacy and numeracy tick boxes sometimes that you put out, but we actually run surveys. They don't have basic skills like being able to put out a form because the government system does not embrace these children and raise them up in a good regard. No, thank you. How do we think that we change that? Because we say that the government, whilst it adopts a broad brush approach that caters to the standard, is different to a community which is able to cater to the individual, which understands the people in its scope and how they learn, and is able to construct a system that is better able to suit them individually. And we do think that system is likely to be one which is focused on literacy and numeracy, because the bizarre thing is, which Joe didn't accept, people are not Idiots, people understand the value of education and reading. People understand the value of getting a job and the value of going to university. Students don't want to slack. The reason why students popped into home ec now is because they are told that they cannot succeed because they haven't met the standards. It was because their teachers encouraged them to go into that subject because then they pass and then it's something that looks good for the school statistics in terms of achievement to government. We say that when a community is empowered to help that child Emma. succeed and is no longer held to arbitrary standards, then these people are able to do better and they will be able to learn to read and to write. I'll take you now, Joe. The same parents you said do not have the time to teach your children their homework are undereducated and struggle to engage in that community. Are these people you want to hand over the curricula to? How are they possibly resolved to manage that process? Schools are unable to bring their community together around them to support them, are unable to teach parents the value of supporting their child in terms of education, because the entire community feels that they have no value in that system, because they feel they have been rejected by that system, because they feel education has persistently failed them and their children. So they say, don't worry, it doesn't matter if you skive off like, I didn't fail, I failed at school either, it didn't do so well for me. You, you shift that mentality when you revert power to their hands and give them autonomy in that regard. And not here, we are not saying the parents who struggled in school themselves should be the teachers. We are saying that they should advise what would have worked for them in school, how they could have been channeled into a different system, what parts of the system failed them. And we think this does work, right? Because it seems Joe has never heard of Kohamarao schools where whole Ewe come together and are able to build up a specified curricula that works well for the people in their area and is able to teach them. Because when people do feel empowered, they do come together and construct a system that is able to teach. Few further things to talk about. So, government, we already told you, and they did not respond to sufficiently, that government is a bad actor. Not only because it is governed by people who are rich and white, but because it is a politicized system that makes issues such as funding and the teaching of Maori history a debate, because it applies broad brush policy that bizarrely is really bad at teaching kids with dyslexia and other kinds of learning disabilities and tends to fail them in high degrees because it does not understand how these broad things work. We say on the comparative local community, these boards are more represented, they cater to local interests, that they raise up the people in and around them. And in that regard, you end up, as well as not teaching a biased history, you also give people language skills, often in their own language, but also in English, that are able to serve them better in life. Lastly, I just want to talk about teachers. Because what Joe wanted to say is that teachers are not experts at teaching children every day. Well, that's the case. Half the people who are sitting in education who you work in education are teachers. So I don't know, how, like ex-teachers, so you don't know how your system is any better. But we also say that white uni students, like Tom,
So if the system is currently failing the disadvantage, then the solution from government is it will take the parents who they claimed had not had the time to invest in their child quite reasonably because it's tough. Tell them that it's their responsibility to now manage the pedagogical, financial, and administrative burden of a school, and not the current board of trustee model, but every part of what the current, like thousand person strong ministry of education currently does for you. And then have them come up with a different qualification system, not based on a minimum standard known to anyone else in the country, and expect those kids to succeed in a world that has not accepted that system. Because you need to engage with a reality check here that those kids will leave those schools and still need to go find a job, still need to engage in the same community you think is dominated by the people who dictate the current system. In that world, it's very difficult for you to get ahead when no one recognizes your qualification. Your teaching has likely been eroded by the fact that people simply try to figure out how to do it. And you haven't been able to be assessed by the same kind of standards that apply to everyone else in a way that allows your skills, even if you do not understand them, even if you do not think you know anything, to be recognised across this country and others. That's not a system that leads to better outcomes. Yeah. What this debate is about, and I'm not being really so far set in New Zealand, but it does apply outside of any kind of country that centralises these kind of systems. Because any country that tries to centralise the same basic incentives. A government that centralises the information about society. What we heard from these guys was like, it's all rich white people doing it because they're the people who are the electors. One, well, that's highly problematic because those people also live in local communities and probably dictate that. But secondly, right, it's just false. Like, while the politicians might be there, often the centralised bureaucracy isn't. Take New Zealand as the example and apply out as you want to any other modern country that has a centralised education system. You often have equal opportunity in things. Why? Because you're a government, you've got operational commercial networks, so you're pretty sitting there like, we need to have a certain amount of women in the society. Well, in society, this is the thing. Um, but in, in the Indian ministry, you need to have like, a certain number of people from a ethnic <laughs> people based on like the fairness of their CVs rather than based on the commercial opportunities or the people you know who have tipped them. And if Richard is watching, this is the defense of his hiring practices, rather than the slander that other people have said about it in the past. <laughs> <laughs> but then we asked ourselves, what's the comparative advantage of that system? One that can assess things. Because they don't just sit in Wellington to go, uh, you know, making policy, they travel the country. Just look at the like, travel bills of anyone from the Ministry of Education who happens to be in this room. But when you're up and down the country, it allows you to connect with those local communities as well. Keep in mind, in a way that local communities cannot connect to each other. Because when you're talking to everyone, it allows you to get information what's going on across the country. And so that maybe the experience of a disadvantaged person in Dunedin is different from that in Auckland on the face of it, but often like, experience very similar things in blocks in your education. Yeah. Having that information allows you to come up with policy outcomes in order to target those people more generally. So yes, it does have a centralised model, but you can use the information that only you can get centrally in order to target those people. Local communities cannot do that. Why? One, they're operating with a much smaller data point source, right? But secondly, right, you hide the accountability in the local community. You know what's really helpful? When people who go into an election, and this goes to the political angle, and fight on the basis that you have failed your country on education. The long tail of unachievement in New Zealand is a line that gets brought up. It's why we have governments sitting there specifically targeting Māori and Pacifica achievements. You don't get education policies going, here's what's good for the white people, guys, because it's not electable, because it's not addressing the failures of the system. The political incentives you wanted to bring into the debate are exactly the incentives that push the central government to target those disadvantaged people, because failure is a national news story. Failure means that votes go against you. Failure is something that you have to deal with on an everyday basis. Let's look at local communities. What happens there? Well, maybe like the local tribune editor goes like, what happened to that kid? You go, well, look, it's individual kids day by day. You don't have the data really to back it up. Because you can't. Because the local experience of people in a local community cannot be aggregated across the country in a way to show the structural disadvantage of it. So you hide the problem away. Second point then. You want to get these communities and say, but like, I'm sure they're well-intentioned. Except, of course, that the communities that aren't well-intentioned. Because you also have to contend with that. For every like school that you like, there's presumably the schools you don't like run by the people that you said were the problem. The electors who are racist, who want the best thing for their kids. 
They get to set up their schools too, guys. Let's apply outside New Zealand for a second and look how that could be. So I get the one just to sit there and go, I think maybe Southern USA local communities setting up ideas that could go schools who might be able to go to those local communities are more likely to exclude black kids from those schools, are more likely to teach racist narratives of how the South works, are more likely to endorse proposals that undermine the achievement of people in society. So at best in that world, you have a symmetrical harm. I, I, don't, I, I don't even understand what symmetrical means. People say so much. I'm really getting into it now. But if you that harm, which at least can get those on the other side, if not worse, if your own argument about who controls elections and controls the education system today holds, it's likely that's a greater number of people. But then for the kids who go into the schools that you want, they're then forced into a world where they don't understand that education system, can't aggregate the policies across their school, and don't know what it is that they're trying to teach. And that's the big problem. Because Joe's point is, sure, one teacher isn't the authority on schools, but when you can look at all teachers and their experiences, maybe you can get a better sense of understanding. So in that sense, the comparative pedagog pedagogical benefits fall on this side of the house. Let's finally look at the standards point. Because I think it is actually really important that kids leave a school with some kind of standard recognised. We heard, but they're not, there's disadvantage. That's true, and it is in fact trending upwards. Why? Because for all the incentives I told you, but also little things like central government has like claims with you know, with groups. If you look at the United States, they have to do things for Native Americans based on treaties that they have signed. Similarly, in New Zealand, the Treaty of Waitangi obliges the Crown, not a local community. That seems like a problem if you screw up. But more importantly, right, it means that you're more likely to try and engage with groups of people on the basis of the real experiences they have, with policy ideas that only you can, uh, can generalise out. But ultimately, right, that political one also means you'll never tolerate the racism and the kind of pressure on students who would otherwise exist in a local community because you can't generalise that out. Your society doesn't look like that as a net. That is an always more moderate society, one that is a more inclusive. When you localise it down, maybe you can target the people who are disadvantaged. But you also give power to the groups of people who want to take more from you. And ultimately, neither of them gets better education. Great. And now we welcome the government member. Richard Daft looms large over this debate because he looms large over the New Zealand education system. And that's fair, because as our opening government has shown, even in New Zealand, with a relatively pristine civil service, bureaucrats still make blind bureaucratic decisions that end up serving people who aren't them. Unfortunately, the question that we ask you at closing government is what if discriminatory decisions aren't because of implicit bias, but because of explicit bias? Because in France today, just as in New Zealand 50 years ago, students, particularly Roma students, are beaten for speaking their own language in those schools. The closing half of this debate will not be about mild-mannered technocrats. It'll be about the way that schools are used as a tool of assimilation and the 3.5 billion young people who live in complex, multi-ethnic states. I will explain two parts of the extension. Firstly, that schools are used for assimilation. Secondly, what happens when these central governments collapse, because they often do, that's the whole reason why Cambridge education system exists. But firstly, a bit of response to the opening half of the I just want to make two remarks. Firstly, on the idea that people are time poor and can't care about their communities. Obviously then, we think they can delegate upwards within those communities, because it's about decisional capacity, about who makes the decisions, rather than about who implements those decisions. So you can just let the central government do what they want until the point they do something you don't like, and then obviously you can tell them to stop doing that particular thing. But moreover, this difference between bureaucrats and individuals only really exists in New Zealand. If you're a bureaucrat from Povo trying to deal with 40 different schools, obviously you are also incredibly time poor to deal with particular issues of particular schools, and they fail all the time. But because bureaucrats are very territorial and don't want people infringing on their particular area, they push back at anyone who tries to get involved, and these problems just go unsolved. Second part, the idea that these schools just don't communicate with each other. Obviously the central government can collect data, and obviously a lot of these schools face similar issues. They use indigenous structures to communicate with each other about solving issues all of the time. We see that in New Zealand with Pacific students who've been failed. First point of extension. Why are schools used as a tool of assimilation, and how do we help solve for that problem? Because opening opposition premises on their case that locals are racist, and people who end up controlling central governments 
aren't racist. But in most systems, you don't have a woke Richard Dodd stopping you from doing okay. it. It's the Sinhalese people in Sri Lanka who are trying to tell Tamil people how they should teach their culture. The first bit of context I think is important here is the way in which schools operate in most places in the world isn't actually particular to educate people. They're a resource extraction yeah, unit that tries to take smart people out of rural communities all across the developing world and concentrate them in superstar cities. That's why if you look at most of the schools in the world, three things happen. Firstly, all of the teachers are trained in the superstar cities and sent out on placement off, just after they've graduated teaching schools. Very few resources are put into making teachers who come from actually these communities. Second, they teach subjects that are very helpful if you go to university in these superstar cities with extremely high fail rates. Almost very few students in South Africa, there's like a 33% pass rate yeah, yeah. for like numeracy and literacy within these communities because of the way that they teach them in a way that is designed to help a small amount of students do well at universities and not actually help most students boost their learning and things. So once they've identified that small number of people, they either explicitly force them to move to superstar cities, which is the model we see in India or China, or they just dangle a lot of incentives in front of them and get them to move there and then strip the people of their ability to have that community. What happens to the other people though? Because what happens is they tend to fail out of those schools and there's no real incentive on the central government to address that problem because they just do not give a fuck about indigenous communities and whether or not they have numeracy and literacy. Do you know who does care about whether indigenous communities have literacy and numeracy? The people who live within those communities who don't just see the schools as a way to help the central government get a couple of smart kids into Rio or into Lagos or into the major superstar cities, which are the reasons that these educational systems are set up in the way they do. So what are the outcomes of this? Yeah, First, yeah. you strip community of talented individuals and leaders, which means the industries are starved. And we're not just talking about small places, we're talking about tier two cities, even in places like Greece and in Italy, where you have huge amounts of students moving towards Rome, moving towards Athens, because the education system and the incentives within it are set up in a way to get them to move to those particularly economically productive regions and starve the other regions in a might like the yeah, ballets yeah. of, of uh, austerity. And that's why we're seeing that growing gap between those types of communities all over the world. But moreover, you strip agency from these communities. You humiliate them by telling them that they can never run their communities and they actually deserve to run their communities. Yeah, yeah. But potentially the scariest thing about it is it's actually used to destroy your culture. Because so. in France, they treat Roma kids like garbage. In Greece, you have Turkish migrants kids who are literally kept in cages in Greek schools. Like, there is a horrific first level of uses that you can stop if you give power to the local community themselves who literally just won't keep these kids in cages. It is horrific the type of behavior that they deal with. And this is more than just not teaching kids that, like about Tetsvati. It's about not allowing them to speak Māori in schools. It's about not allowing them any of the most basic things yeah, yeah. that are important to them. How do we resist that? Firstly, you teach them your own language. First policy, major benefit on our side of the house in resisting assimilation, because you become less useful to be extracted into those other areas. Yeah, yeah. Secondly, you care about all of the students. You don't just care about the four students who end up going to the university in Rio. You have to care about all the students within that community. Thirdly, you give students the skills that they need, not just the ones that are marginally useful. I just don't think most people use very complex mathematics, and that's shown by the fact that most students who are sitting in this course fail across the world and just aren't cared about. So you teach people the skills they actually need, you have much more engagement with the local economy and community. Then, yes, please. So if Roma are, are a minority in their local yes. community, why does anything change under your front house? And if they're a majority in the local community, why would they ever tolerate that sort of behavior by nationally the higher teachers? They don't have control. They have to tolerate that behavior because there's a huge amount of government pressure on the zoo and their complaints fall on deaf ears. I'm sorry, are you just thinking like the Persian and Turkish kids should rebel against the Greek government who is treating them excruciatingly awfully? Obviously we can't protect people who live in majority dominated communities, but a lot of places in the world have local communities that are quite homogenous. If you go to India, if you go to Brazil, if you go to like all across Europe, you still find communities large enough to sustain their own schools. So obviously that's not enough in response. Second Part of extension. Collapse. This is one of my pet topics. Anyone here do the Cambridge system? That was designed to pump into little countries who had failed education systems because they put all of their chips in the central government and then it failed. What they do is they import huge amounts of teachers and bureaucrats to run that education system, which potentially works for a bit, but then you have a civil war or a financial crisis like you had in Argentina or enforced austerity you had in Greece and these centralized education systems collapse. Now that leaves two things. Firstly, there's no know-how because all the people who were running your education system just go home because they were paid a lot by the government to be there and now they don't really care anymore. But B, your people still don't have a mandate to get involved. So it's very unsure when you're a parent how much you should go before you get clapped back by the government or by other teachers, which means there's big collective action problems, a lot of inaction and action solving these types of problems.
I know I've been training off the world, so I'm training myself not to talk about New Zealand, but obviously this debate isn't about New Zealand. Go away now, we welcome the opposition member. I'm glad we finally brought in this debate outside of New Zealand and outside of the Western world generally, because what's clear in this debate is that while education is important here, it's far more important in the developing world, because education serves two really key purposes. Firstly, in countries where national identity is still new and fragile, it's a crucial way to forge a new national identity. So in the first of our two extensions, I'm going to tell you about how the centralization of education creates a form of nation building that, unlike the assimilation Daniel wants to talk about, actually enforces and entrenches a pluralistic and inclusive form of national identity in those countries to the benefit of development. But secondly, that the centralization in these developing countries is also essential to expanding education more efficiently and more cheaply in a way that allows countries with poor state capacity to still build up the forms of vital education they need to achieve the standard of living they deserve in the 21st century. So it's probably going to be a closing half debate. It's just making sure it's us over Daniel's team. So <laughs> well, after I talk about like so, I've got those two extensions of nation building and expansion of education. A lot of rebuttal is going to be integrated. But just two quick things at the outset. So the material about super cities, I want to deal with quite quickly because the mass move of urbanization towards like large urban conglomerates in developing countries actually seems generally like quite a good thing for a number of reasons. It centralizes a lot of the brain power in the short term in a way that then produces massive, massive amounts of short-term economic development. At the point at which that development then occurs, the, like the state's coffers is sufficiently increased, that money then often will then filter back to those regions where the status quo and state capacity is poor and more likely to be also locked to Daniel wanted to care about it so much. Then secondly, this idea about this form of explicit bias in the form of things like directly abusing and mistreating minority people in schools. First of all, that material can only exist and can only be properly affected in the context of ethnic enclaves where that oppressed minority group is a majority in that particular school district. Because in a world where the Roma kid is still a minority, which they are in every locality in France, if white French people are still as awful as Daniel wants them to be, that majority in the local school board will still oppress them as badly and nothing actually changes. And so when Shaked P.O.I. said at a point where it's an ethnic majority enclave, they can just actually rebel against a particularly oppressive central government. I'm shocked that Daniel is unfamiliar with the concept of a school walkout as a really crucial tool of civil rights protest. That was literally the reason why schools in the South had to stop calling the Civil War the War of Northern Aggression, because African-American majority schools walked out from that oppressive community. So we don't particularly think we make that sort of stood up in this debate. That's all I've got for extraneous rebuttal. Now let's move in to these two points of extension. First point of extension on nation building. So as I played my introduction, this is a really, really crucial form of the way in which we construct our national identity. I hate to go all polls one on one on you, but we live in imagined communities, they're constructing our society around us, and they form the basis of the solidarity with other people in our nation community that allows us to build up a functioning civil society. Education is really crucial because civics education, historical education, the set texts in your schools delineate to you in an educational context what your nation is, who constitutes the nation, and what the nation is about in terms of ideology. Why, at the point at which it's centralized, do you get a far more effective and inclusive message? For a couple of structural reasons. First of all, in societies that are particularly fractious and have multiple different markers of identity in the nation, so countries that are particularly ethnically or religiously diverse, at the point at which it is devolved down to the local level, that means you get the construction of separate, parallel, and conflicting forms of national identities. So the world of local education they want to talk about in the developing world looks an awful lot like Lebanon, which is split between roughly one-third groups of Shia, Sunni, and Maronite Christians. 
And in the case of a divorce at the local level, all the Christians go to Christian schools and for the first 18 years of their lives get constructed a Christian form of Lebanese national identity, and the same happens for the Sunni and the Shia. They then go out into the world around them and discover that there are lots of people for whom the idea of what being Lebanese is is fundamentally opposed and different from theirs. That undermines the whole basis of solidarity that you need for civil society to work, for politics to be effective, and for the transfers of resources in that country to be allocated by need rather than narrow ethnic bases. So, Speaker. why do we think then? Actually, yeah, I'll tell you a few lines first. From who? Uh, from Daniel. Yeah. It's nice to talk about imagined communities, but the most visible marker that your nation is not united is the fact that people speak different languages. Why isn't eradicating the local language the first step in the national unity project that you like so much? Okay, so in countries of linguistic diversity, you can still construct a centralized curriculum that teaches one common language that all people can unify around and then allows a special course for whatever local language exists in, the, in that locality. So that's like the model of India, right? Where English exists as a neutral language, so Bengalis and Hindis can communicate with one another, and they still have that local language as one module in a centralized system. So we think it's pretty good at people able to talk to people from other parts of the country that builds up the solidarity we talk about. So structurally, why is a centralized form of education far more likely to be inclusive? Because federal level coalitions will invariably be results of political compromise between different groups at, at the point at which the country is particularly diverse. So that means that they have an incentive to ensure it's compromised. They have an incentive to ensure it's not too repressive to avoid the kinds of boycotts and walkouts I talked about earlier in my speech. And also because, right, in a fractious community, there are going to be lots of local, like local levels that aren't competitive between particular groups because there's a particularly large majority and those governments don't turn over, and they can entrench a single form of education. At the federal level, where governments turn over fairly regularly, there's a political incentive to ensure there's a system of education that is neutral and non-controversial, and that just putters along between governments. That's one that's likely to be based around compromise and the accommodation of different identities. So we get far more solidarity on our side than has a far more inclusive national identity. Secondly, expansion of education. As well as constructing a national identity, education is still good at teaching people things they need to do to grow in the world about them. Why is it easier at the point which is centralized? Just like the really boring, basic, but hugely important things of economies of scale, right? This looks like things like standardized textbooks that you can easily disseminate across the country very easily. This looks like not having to construct parallel local levels of teacher training and accreditation in each singular state and locality. And also, particularly in developing countries, local level education systems are far more open to corruption and capture than a centralized state level. So in India, where most education is centralized, but civil service state exams are localized, there was huge and corruption in particular state civil service exams because it turns out right it's pretty cheap to buy media production state education minister and you can do that quite easily but you can't buy off a federal education minister at the same level because far more people are watching out for it and it's far more overt so you get far less capture of local education in countries that are also still struggling with developing both anti-graft mechanisms you get better education you get more inclusive education very very proud to stand in opposite <laughs> Thank you much there. Welcome to the government. Thank At least half the case we've gotten in this debate from each half of the opposition bench has completely missed the thrust of what we got from the very beginning of Prime Minister out on opening government. The argument that we just heard from the previous speaker that centralization is beneficial because it gives us economical benefits, right? Economies of scale that allow us to purchase textbooks and distribute them en masse completely ignores the fundamental problem we had, which was the textbooks that you were buying en masse. The fact that you were using a financial justification to peddle a curriculum that was not helpful for the majority of people you gave those textbooks to. I'm not, you know, unfortunately for Shaken and Taran, I'm not as certain it's a closing half debate as it is a government bench <laughs> one. So well, I'm going to do a couple of things in my speech. First, I'm going to talk about assimilation, now our extension, and why that's the most important thing in this debate, and those harms are, are still incredibly important at the end of the debate, differentiating myself 
from um, opening here. Second, I'm going to talk about whether or not set centralized standards and curricula have provided equitable access to education and, and to uh, a good quality of life in the future. And finally, I'm going to talk about whether or not there's a significant risk of losing out on valuable information that must necessarily be provided um, centrally, things like Tereo Maori and, and the risk that opening talked about there. So first, let's talk about assimilation. This is where um, Daniel obviously brought into the debate for everyone in the room and told you that in uh, across most of the world where we agree education is most important for the individuals receiving it, it's not just that, that education is uh, well-intentioned but failing in its goals. It is, a, is a deliberate tool for resource extraction to turn individuals who don't live in the most urban centers of these countries into little economical productive units so that when they move, like that, that essentially coerces them into moving into, for example, in Brazil, uh, Rio, and then essentially living as second-class right. citizens while being told that that's the good life that they should strive for from the beginning. The okay. no, not yet. After this point, should go. Um, um, the, the problem with the problems with that, I think Daniel outlined quite clearly in terms of what it does to a, a human being and particularly to a child. Essentially, from the moment you enter the the uh, education when it's um, centrally decided, your fundamental value systems about life and what you should, what you think is important are shaped by individuals who don't have your best interests at heart, but rather only converting you into a unit of economic productivity. That is something which needs to be changed. I don't think we heard enough of a response to the simulation material um, from, from those guys. Yes. So if you've got this malevolent centralized apparatus that's extracting children, on your side of the house, why doesn't it just seize control of the local government like the Chinese Communist Party controls all local officials in China so we just continue the extraction? Because I don't think that I don't think that centralized government in like in Brazil, for example, is like centralized government in China. I think that local communities in, in a lot of these in a lot of these places across the world, like Brazil and India, would actually have the power to be able to educate people in the way that they want. I don't think that that's a huge issue. Um, I also just don't think that the government's going to be able to do that for every single community that decides to locally run a school and teach kids in the way that they want. If so, I mean, good effort. So at the end, you know, so, so essentially the response that we got from closing there was a, just an examination of the context that if these, um, if, if it is a minority, a child from a minority, living in a community where they are still a minority, then this proposal might not help them that much. Fine, we can see that. But if it, if as is the case throughout most of the developing world, or is very, very common in the developing world, you do find minorities who are concentrated in communities that, that are comprised of them as a majority, and that's where we think this is going to be incredibly effective at helping those individuals to access better education. I think the response from that side to, to even these communities, where, you're, where you are a minority but a majority in your local community, that they should just like rebel against the central government and stage walks out, walkouts from school. And, and the idea that that is a reasonable way to expect people to fight for their basic human right to education is just absolutely absurd. Because individuals in those communities shouldn't have to make the choice between accessing some form of education that the state's providing, although in an incredibly subpar way, and then not accessing that education at all to try and get like, you know, a policy change over the course of the next decade. This is a solution that addresses all of those problems, uh, you know, at the root and much more concisely and quickly. That's why we think that we need to stop schools across the world being used as tools of assimilation. The final point that I want to say, and I'm still talking about this though, is about native language and its importance, which I think Daniel emphasized for you in his speech. The, the, the beginning of the erasure and the deliberate eradication of minority culture is, and the most significant part of it is, preventing those individuals from using their language on a daily basis and, and, and um, uh, you know, amongst each other. The response we got from that side to the POI was incredibly glib, right? Well, I guess that learning your own language is a really good thing, and I guess that if we centralize education, okay. some schools can still have the flexibility to do that. Like, just get real. First thing to say here is that not all developing countries are as linguistically diverse as, like, India. If you look at Brazil, the reality of the situation is, even if they can teach English, that no one chooses to do that. Uh, even if they can teach in their own language, no one chooses to do that because it's infinitely more productive for you to teach your students in English and for them to pass their courses in English. So second issue then in this debate, now that I've dealt with that, it's only fair. <laughs> if you're a minority child in a region of France that voted for Marion Le Pen and the Nationalists, are you more or less likely to be suffer torment if your local community seizes control of the education system? Less likely to suffer torment because the torment that happens right now is is it literally occurs because you are a minority in those communities. At least, at least if it is a Roma school running that curriculum for Roma students, then we say less. Um, so moving on then to centralized standards and curricula, equitable access to education. 
I think that the like one of the most ludicrous arguments from opening government here was what they said at the end of their case, where they essentially said centralization is good because it is an effective tool and a uniquely effective tool for gathering information about the problem. Like if we didn't have centralized education and curricula, then we just wouldn't know what the problem was. But what that fails to understand is that the centralized curricula is creating the problem, right? We don't have an issue with not knowing how many, or not knowing in a standardized way how many students are failing relative to others, because we trust that local communities will be able to assess the intelligence of their students in a way that allows them to live a meaningful life. So there weren't any benefits to centralization, despite what that side wanted to tell you. And finally, with regards to the risk of, of certain valuable information that needs to be centralized in order to be propagated. The reality of this argument is that for um, you know uh, you know communities that decide to stop teaching evolution or communities that do become uh, less less diverse and less equitable, that that we're willing to bite that arm because it just doesn't even compare to the benefits that individuals and in local communities get. At the point where you are someone from a family who doesn't believe in evolution, but you are forced to learn it from a centralized curriculum, that is not like particularly effective at changing your mind if every day you go home and you talk to your parents and they tell you that that's all bullshit and something you have to sit through for a while. So the harm there is negligible, incredibly proud to you. Uh, for you. Great, and now for final speech, we welcome the opposition. <laughs> Educational policy is an incredibly high stakes exercise in developing countries, both because the rapid expansion of education in a country like India is essential to securing broad based economic growth that includes everyone, and because the construction of a unifying national identity in a fragile multi ethnic society is absolutely vital for preventing inter ethnic conflict and collapse into civil war. At Closing Opposition, we brought you the crucial mechanisms that showed why central coordination of education policy is vital both for nation building and for the efficient expansion of education in countries with undereducated populations, because that was the highest stakes material in the debate. That's why we won this debate. I'm going to do three things in this speech. First, I'm going to respond to Closing Government's extension, then I'm going to go through the two planks of our extension, dependent on criticisms, and explain why it's really important. Let's respond to Closing Government's extension. So they had two things here, right? First, uh, these extraction machines of taking kids to superstar cities. Three responses. Firstly, this is just like not true, right? All we heard was a long series of assertions from Daniel. But in reality, just think about the fact that most countries phrase their educational targets in terms of like broad-based literacy and numeracy targets, right? India is like, our target is to get 95% of people literate, not to get like 3,000 genius kids doing like <laughs> IT, right? That's just not how countries do their education policy. That was a lie. Second response, even if we accept that it's true, as I mentioned in my POI, if the centralized apparatus has so much power to do this, then it's just going to capture the local communities and continue to do that, right? Aaron's response was like, well, sometimes that's not feasible. But it is just always feasible, even if not in a uh, incredibly centralized state like the Chinese government, right? For example, in Brazil, if the government really does have this huge financial incentive to extract superstar kids, they can just like pour money into local elections to have their preferred candidate win. They can have their national party descend on the area and run a huge propaganda campaign. So there, the problem doesn't even get solved. Third response, it's just like not clear why this is bad, right? Yes. Rapid urban development in China lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, broadly a good thing. They never get a most reason to think it was bad. Second plank of their extension, explicit oppression of minority in schools. I think Taryn knocked this out pretty effectively, right? Firstly, note that most minorities tend to be minorities even in their local community. So their case only secures benefits in enclaves, which means their case is already extremely limited in scope and their benefits are extremely limited. But even in enclaves, what Taryn said is you can have walkouts. In Arizona, Aaron's response was pretty tepid, right? He was just like, well, you shouldn't have to walk out to secure your right. Well, sometimes it's necessary to do that, right? And often you won't even have to walk out because the threat of a walkout will deter the government from introducing policies that trigger a walkout because walkouts are costly. So that knocks out closing government's case. Let's get back to our extension. The first thing we told you uh, was that expansion of education in countries that have incomplete education systems, right? Countries where 10 or 10, 20 or 30% of the population in rural areas or in urban slums still aren't literate is incredibly important because that's how you trigger economic development in countries like India. Why do you get much more rapid expansion of education when you have a centrally coordinated curriculum? Karen gave you two reasons, right? First, because you can centrally mass produce textbooks, which can be done way more cheaply, right? It's literally, I, I want to emphasize how important this point is. It's literally 
literally just not affordable for each local community in India to write and print its own textbook. Like, that's just not possible. Their, their schools just never get built because the local communities don't have enough money. But secondly, you can like centrally train teachers to pool your limited expertise at a national level and improve the education and impart the curriculum to everyone. But secondly, as Taryn explained, you get systematically more corruption at the local level than the national level, both because it's cheaper to buy off politicians at the local level and because watchdogs and media that can expose corruption tend only to operate at the national level, not at the local level. The only response we heard to this was Taryn was, well, rapid expansion of education isn't good if, as openly government says, the textbooks aren't helpful. But I just like deny this, right? The textbooks are just teaching literacy and numeracy, right? They're just teaching math. I don't think the material from open government, which is highly specific to New Zealand, applies to the context of like rural rollouts of education in India. So it wasn't sufficient to Aaron for fallback on uh, opening material here. Don't we still think schools should just focus on effectively teaching language and numeracy to people of different racial and poverty backgrounds rather than your weird pseudo nationalist ideas? <laughs> no, no, no. So I'm going to get to that first, right? But like nation building in fragile societies is really important because it what it's what prevents interethnic conflict, right? Sure, it's not fun to be taught in a language that's not your native language, but it's far preferable to like having your community be terrorized by interethnic violence because the national government hasn't successfully created a national unifying story that prevents people from collapsing into conflict with each other, right? So it, that's just like low stakes stuff. We're fine with teaching people in a national language if that means that we can actually create coherent societies that don't collapse into civil war. So let's get on to this unifying national identity stuff. We told you that in order to create a national identity, you need a unified civic and historical mythology. You need unifying communication of some central values and some central cultural touchstones, like you need to teach the same fictional texts in all the schools. That was essential to get central coordination. Why are we likely to get this sort of wholesome unifying curriculum if educational policy is designed at the national level? Taryn gave you several reasons. Firstly, he explained to you how national governments in these areas tend to consist of these broad-based coalitions spanning multiple ethnic and religious groups. Why is that? It's because historically, you needed to gather a broad critical mass of society to overthrow colonial powers and dictators, which means that the coalitions that emerged in these societies, like in India, for example, tended to be very broad based. That's why the Indian National Congress, which was a secular party based on the unification of a variety of different religions and ethnicities, designed the country's educational program, which is still in place to this day, and emphasizes a secular and unifying yes. Indian national identity that spans different ethnic boundaries. It's because of those historical reasons that ensures that you have this sort of wholesome policy, because when you have a broad based coalition, you have to have compromise in the construction of curriculum, and the construction of the curriculum can't be dominated by one ethnic group. But secondly, as Taryn told you, because turnover tends to be quite high in national elections as compared to local elections, there's an incentive for political parties to cooperate to create a depoliticized curriculum so that there isn't just a flippity floppity of curriculum from election to election. That's really important, whereas in local elections where one party tends to dominate forever, you don't get that sort of depoliticization, which also responds to a lot of the material from the government bench. At the end of this debate, you need to ask yourself how we create broad-based national unity in a country like Ghana. The first president uh, of Ghana said something, I'm trying to remember the quote, <laughs> he said, we've got our independence. What we need now isn't guns, it's an education, because that's the way you create economic development, that's the way you create a coherent national story that put, convinces people to put down their weapons, to talk to each other, to create a unified society. We're very, very proud to oppose. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.